does the space work. And so it was an incredible experience, tons of preparation, hours and hours of training that uh, have taken part over the two and a half years prior to the mission. In now it used to be that if you took one sort of work, you'd be trained to be six hours space force under water. And going to the back of the space station as well, when we run through all the procedures, all the checks, all the drills, we even have a virtual reality and have separate from the platform so that we can plan our routes and we can plan to all the way down to half of the way out there. I probably, I was probably more prepared for this space walk than anything that I've ever done in my life. So finally on space walk day, this is the airlock just as to arrive and we're getting ready to open the hatch. I was amazed actually at how how jam packed it was in there, and we had a huge box to see the actual thing that was going to be there. And it was taking up a lot of space, we also had a couple of tool bags in there, and there was a huge bag of tool bags, and we had another light that we had to repair it during the space walk. So there was really no room to move around in there. Okay, Tim started getting ready to open the hatch, and as soon as the sunlight started coming in, that was really for me the moment which I kind of breathed the sigh of relief. Which is so great. Now that we can finally go out and do what we've trained to do. Because until that moment, you're never sure if you're going to do a space walk. So many things can go wrong. You've got to do all the training. And really, that's the moment. And for me, it was very similar to when I was a test pilot. I was finally sorting all this planning and preparation. And finally, it's nice when you close the front of the doors to the engines. It's like, right, I'm going to ask them to go do what we do. So at that point, I relaxed. Tim went out the hatch first, and then I came out after him. But this is probably, for me, one of the most memorable moments of my life, which was descending down into this black abyss. Uh, I've had all the pieces of the pillars out to Tim, so by the time I got out of the space station, it was actually going from day to night, and the planet beneath me was completely black. And that was just an incredible feeling to, to lower yourself out of the airlock. We're going to need our helmet for space to protect you from the vacuum of space. And the other guy hanging around outside, I had about five minutes waiting for the airlock because Tim had to go and cut my anchor point further up on the truss. We were always connected to the space station by a thin steel cable so that it could let go by mistake. And that's kind of our last uh, ditch defense for floating away if you got the suspense of the thin steel cable. So he cut my anchor point and we go ahead to go to the after him. Um, we got out there pretty quickly, we were pretty quiet, that was our intention, we were going to be sent to each other, right, as we were going to be missing around, let's get out to the trust, and far out of the source, because we just need to kind of get the work side ready, and make sure that everything is perfect, because the most important part of the space, the space war, the thing we've really counted, was to replace this electrical box. The space station was down on the end of its electrical power, so that was the primary objective. And now we got there so early that we had 15 minutes to spare before the sun went down. I don't think the mission controlling NASA has ever said to two astronauts on the space wall, hey guys, hang on, take photos for 15 minutes. It was absolutely incredible. They didn't want us to do anything else. We were ready for the job and we weren't able to touch anything until the sun went down because everything was live, no electricity coming from the solar panels to the boxes. So we literally had to wait until the sun went down before we were allowed to go in there, touch the boxes, and we missed the image. Thankfully, that went really smoothly. And even on our way back to the airlock with the field team, you know, Houston and the sun had come up, and Houston said, Yes, hey guys, it's all going well. The station's back on the airlock, so we're not going to go. So the job was done, and uh, we're actually sure that we're going to be able to do that. Unfortunately, after about four hours into the space wall, Tim noticed water coming into his helmet. Now, a similar situation happened in 2013 with my European colleague in the Park Drive from Italy. And uh, they had a similar situation, and of course they had to turn it back in the end. It was quite serious. So we have checks and drills in place since that emergency situation. We knew that potentially the water was going to get worse and worse. So if you said, hey guys, it's time to call in to see if this is a problem, it's getting worse. So unfortunately, after four hours, 45 minutes, I had to go and to get six hours space walk, we came back in. But thankfully, the plan in charge of the room come. Now, obviously, on board the space station, it's a very, very busy place, and much as we love doing the space walks, and that's not we're not really there to do space walks, we're there to do science. So, most of our time is taken up with science. Some of the science activities that I enjoy the most with various groups are both science, and that means 
means it's actually studying all of the human bodies where the DNA breaks and that of the gas flows. When you go into space, your body goes through the most incredible change in a very short period of time. One of the first things you notice as soon as you go into a zero gravity is that all the fluid that is coming out from the human legs and your legs here, it shifts up into around your chest area. And you can feel the pressure increasing with that. You might actually get puffy face, you get more dark nose, and some of us will suffer from headaches as well because of this increased pressure. So your body reacts quite rapidly by saying, okay, hey, let's lose the body fluid, let's get back to normal levels. So you're losing body fluid, uh, your cardiovascular system has a really easy time of heart, uh, it's all fine with it, it doesn't have to work against gravity to pump the blood around. But your cardiovascular system ages, it ages about 20 years in six months of space. Your muscles start to deteriorate, the waste away, the bone density reduces, your immune system is depleted. Your skin ages, your eyesight gets worse. Uh, it's amazing how much you can hear to speak to you on the But um, what's, what is truly remarkable is that after only one month being back on Earth, everything has turned completely to normal as it was before the launch, with the exception of my bone density, which will probably take about a year to fully recover. So it's incredible that the body is your body is so good and adapted to new environments for us going into space and coming back from space. But of course, we study the many uh, different aspects of the scientific approach to how soon it possibly can so we can find out more about the human body and what the benefits for people who are working with the research. Something else I did, uh, of course, was really cool, was to get to drive a Mars rover from the space station. Now, unfortunately, this rover wasn't on Mars. It was actually on Earth. It was an astronaut. My son is a steam bridge. The astronaut got his steam bridge. This rover was called Bridget. But what was great is that I had a task to drive this rover into a cave and find seven objects that had been hidden there, identify them, map them, and we were testing out the ability for astronauts to be able to control rovers on Mars or on future terrestrial surfaces whilst orbiting planet Earth um, using a different command and control system. So it was really fascinating to be able to drive that thing whilst orbiting the planet and eventually not crashing the diet. Now, the space station is over 15 years old, but we have to keep it constantly updated. It's always getting upgrades, it's got a new size. And so if you've ever looked behind your day and thought of wiring, it's pretty fast. There are thoughts for us up there, because this is what the US laboratory looks like when all the wiring is out. On this particular day, we have to rewire the US laboratory. So uh, it was a pretty, pretty hard day, and we were very hard to reach the point of the object in the wrong place. But um, the maintenance activity on board the space station is certainly very important. I thought I'd show you a picture of the space station for you. Because more often than not, questions come up about it, so I thought I'd actually show you today. But the point here is that on board the space station, the astronauts have to be able to really write it whilst we are the electrical students on the Earth Promise and so if anything fails, we don't want to fix it. Now, obviously, we have a great amount of support from the mission control centers, but we're also the plumber, and so when the boom fails, we fix it too. Another job that astronauts do is to operate the space station's robotic arm. And this is an incredible internet piece of equipment. Now, we use it on spacewalks. Astronauts sometimes they attach to the robotic arms and they can get moved around outside the space station. We also use it to grapple and visit a cargo vehicle. Because a lot of the cargo vehicles that they all about food, about clothing, and about water and supplies, they don't actually get to the space station automatically. They just plant themselves about 10 meters underneath the space station. Our job is to use this robotic down and to go and grab it. On the bottom right there, you can see that's on the Siggins supply vehicle being grabbed by the robotic down. Now, you might think that this is a very swept up automatic procedure, but actually, it's very basic. It's two hand controllers, and you're controlling that arm in six axes. And in order to do that, you can't afford to have any other control because there's faster spy. So the whole space station, the thrust is not the navigation part of the job, so it gets disabled, it's basically a bit of floating, mass in space, it's tumbling in space. And the cargo vehicle itself disables all its thrust, so you never have two vehicles very close 
close to each other, but they treat it as a tumbling in space. And in the short space of time, what we can do is just to use that part to go in and grab it. There are no laser range finders, there are no automatic tracking systems, no crew makers behind you, all these are the four kinds of pictures of the space we have. So we need to have far away from things in these four sheets and things, and so this time we just now have two more people to see it. So it's remarkably basic, but it does work, but it's certainly under a huge amount of pressure as an individual when you're connecting one of these kind of vehicles. And that's captured the driver of the vehicle, which was now the top picture where um, and then, uh, thankfully, uh, I'm going to to find this picture shows me training for it in the top. But we probably need to do about in the order of maybe 500 to 1,000 practice packages over the space of two and a half years in the to mission. So it's one of those things you can practice and practice and practice and just have one attempt. This is what the inside of the car can be. This is the simplest thing. You see all the white uh, bags, that's new stuff that's coming up outside, it's not clear. All the blue bags is our, is our traditional garbage. Um, obviously, on board the space station, we generate garbage and we have to throw it away. So, what happens to it? Well, the sickness vehicle burns up and the gas atmosphere. So, we fill this thing up with as much trash as possible and then it burns up. Uh, and that trash includes everything. So I think clearly when you might have worn to uh, foods, uh, you know, uh, packaging, for example, and also when we use the glue. Now, when we use the glue, we try to recycle what was much there as possible. And in fact, we're up to about 80 to 85% of recycling in the space station. So, uh, you know, yesterday is beer, it's this morning's coffee, quite frankly. But uh, it, actually, it actually tastes absolutely fine. The drinking water on the space station tastes great. Um, yeah, it does go through a very rapid recycling process. But the next thing would be it's the brine, which is pretty nasty stuff. That has to get thrown away along with the other stuff. So, uh, next time you look up and see a shooting star, you may not be a shooting star. Also, I'm interested in what the type of things that are top right, but that brain flu is our own gallery table. Uh, after 15 years of use, it was being replaced with a new gallery table, so that opens the time. So, that was an issue of what people that was really important. I kind of touched on it at what we did on Saturday afternoon, which was the education outreach program. And we managed to reach over a million school children and students during the mission, which is absolutely incredible. It was the most successful European mission that we've ever had in terms of education outreach. And that was thanks to a huge effort by the European Space Agency, and in particular the UK Space Agency. And we obviously tried to reach out uh, in terms of science and engineering to inspire the next generation of scientists and engineers to help encourage students at school to be involved in STEM subjects. But more than that, we wanted to try and use space as a really exciting environment to try and encourage uh, children to students in all areas, such as art and drama and music and nutrition and literature and exercise. So we went a number of different programs, which may be something in the audience to in addition to that, we also did outreach in terms of talking to schools. I love doing this as a collaborator. Um, every opportunity we had, we would get three million and three million radio requirements just to talk to 23 schools in 10 different countries. And uh, by using the kind of video systems, we were able to stream on the meetings that we reached over 50,000 students. So when I wasn't doing space or science or maintenance or PR or uh, any other activities like that, this is part of the way with a family. And this is the people who are there on board the space station uh, taking photographs. Um, it was amazing to, to look at Planet Earth or when you first look at Planet Earth from the space station, the kind of uh, overwhelmed by the technology. You can see about 2,000 kilometers in any direction. So if I was over front of the house, I could look over and see Greece in one direction, but it's not over here, I could look over and see Scotland. So you kind of, uh, it's, it's overwhelming, but the longer you stay up there, the more you start looking at the detail, and you start noticing the small things, like the big lakes that lead you to Mount Everest and the Himalayas, or maybe a volcano in Kamchatka that was erupted a couple of days ago and you want to check on them. 
but you really get the feel that you don't think it's enough in front of a short period of time, which sounds very strange, but um, I was talking to somebody a couple of weeks ago who was from Madagascar, and I found this a long time ago, and I found this a long time ago, which I haven't at all, I've never been there, but I really do know it, I've had it, I've seen it so much, but I know all of it is all of this trees and things are, and it's beautiful, but I really don't think I'm guessing. I was seeing two fill or I do, you know, the whole planet is quite strange. But it was that, it just made me realize what a spinning thing it is that we have. So after just six months in space, we all too quickly, it was time to come back to planet to Earth. It was going to take six hours to get up to the space station. It only takes about three hours to get back down. Now this is quite an exciting three hours now, because you go for a game of engine bones to stay around. The most important thing about going back to Earth is that the engine starts. Because it doesn't start in the brain or anything like that. You need to slow down from that 25 times the speed of sound. So the beyond gravity, you can put into the atmosphere. And then the atmosphere will do the rest, that will do the brain. So the engine burn is extremely important. And it has to be very precise, very accurate. Because it burns too short, then you have a lot of angle for coming in. It burns too long, and you've got to escape the angle for coming in. But you're not going to experience too much change, too much degenerating. So the engine burn has to go perfectly. And now, uh, thankfully for us, it did. The A space craft separates, and then it's in the middle, which is just the same point you'll have to look from the back end of the atmosphere. The other two parts of the space craft burn up in the atmosphere. One of the crazy things about coming back is that once the space craft is separated, you're only a couple of hundred kilometers above the Earth, and you're coming back. You're just waiting for the Earth's atmosphere to pick you up. And at this point, when you look out the window, you start to see the Earth much, much closer than you have for the previous six months. And imagine a nice, steady, stable space station configuration during a tiny tunnel in the actual literature is falling to Earth. And you really get the impression that you're just falling. And then the atmosphere picks you up, it puts the spacecraft in the correct orientation, picks you up first. And that's when you start to feel the geo is built up as you start entering the atmosphere. Everything that can burn outside the spacecraft starts to burn, the heat gets up to about 2,000 degrees Celsius. So it really is very hot outside, and surprisingly hot inside. And our air cooling system really struggles to keep it cool with that amount of heat being generated. So we're literally drenched in sweat inside at the same point we're coming back. And if the geo is built up and out, we're doing that to about 6.5 Gs. And uh, it's very hard to breathe, it's like an elephant sitting on your chest. The way you go out, you get scorched over. And you can see on the top left there, that's the, the plasma phase. That's just before the wind blow really starts to get scorched over and burned. Later on in the descent, you can't even see the sparks and flames dry outside the window because it's just burned over the building. We have to have a few minutes of entering the Earth's atmosphere. The braking chute comes down. Now, the braking chute has to slow you down. So it's a safe speed for the main parachute to open. And the braking chute lasts about 20 seconds. And that's the most violent 20 seconds of the entire engine. Because at that time, the capsule is in the shape of the engine. The braking chute is vibrating from side to side. It's not easy now. This is like the largest road border person you've ever been on. And then after that, normally the parachute opens up in a big job. But the interesting thing about the descent is that you, know, you speak to other astronauts, experienced astronauts, and certainly have an earring next to it as well, and you're breathing it out and it's great. So I think everything is going to happen. And if you didn't have somebody doing that, you would think things that you know, you're going to die on several occasions during the reentry, because it's not so bad as we said, you know, this is a central element, and so this is the best thing that happens, and I'll tell you more. That's what you should expect. And one thing that uh, many astronauts have told me to expect was expect the parachute to open with a big jolt. But uh, you have to be in the middle of the jolt as well. And so after that, I was watching the clock and I knew exactly when it would be needed to happen on time. And after about 15 seconds, we played big jolts. I thought, this is interesting. I mean, she was in it. But um, we do have a reserve shooter and it's not a big jolt with a reserve shooter. You know, it was like that's close to the area. It was just kind of like, it was funny. So at that point, I was like, okay, okay, I guess that's the main shooter in front of me. We then have about 15 minutes or we can use the canopy until the biscuit happens to the bottom. Uh, what you see in the middle there is soft, uh, soft banding thrusters, which don't give you a soft banding, but they, they, they call them that just to make us feel better. And they trigger about 27 meters off the ground, and can be measured into just being in a small car crash in the middle, and so a large car crash. So it really does pick up the front, and a trick to the wrong, 
the trick to not hurting yourself when the story is happening is to use the key during the descent of this what you're going to be used when you're being pushed back into your seat, six and a half keys. That's the time to really uh, try to be a hard risk because that means that you're going to be very, very firmly distracting and landing when you're not hurting much. Um, so that's just a quick random mission point of view. Uh, I don't think I'm going to talk for too long, but I've left plenty of time for any questions that you might have. I think Steve's going to help me out with questions here and there. I think she's going to answer them as I can. I think I have something on the question that looks like it's going to be easy to carry on. I'm going to start with one hand, but you'll have fun. Okay, what well, was the total of burning when I'm at the moment of life in space? Yes, um, somebody said to me, what on earth did you decide to run around the marathon? Um, I was not doing that, but actually, if we do it so much, it was training anyway. I was going to be training for two hours every day on a treadmill or bike machine or on a weightlifting machine. And so I thought, it's not actually that much extra work to do with the marathon. Um, what I didn't realize is just how painful the harness system is going to be. And that harness keeps us strapped down with some bungees onto the new weight machine. And it really, I was very glad that I acknowledged in December that I didn't have to do the math until April because it gave me all that time to get my harness really quickly tested and to get fitted really well. But um, when I was riding back from I was going to do it, I was planning to do it in about four, four and a half hours, and I ended up doing it in just over three and a half hours. And people said to me, Well, you must be feeling really strong, really good for the marathon. And I said to my medical team, I said, No, my shoulders weren't ugly. And so I had to finish it as quickly as possible. So that's why I got faster and faster and faster during the marathon. So it was very hard on the shoulders where I got my arms. I don't want to take a question there from there. I'm not going to show up. It's fine. What was the most amazing thing I saw? Uh, that's what a great question. You know, the thing I, I really was looking forward to seeing was the Aurora. And I thought maybe I was going to see it once or twice during the mission. I couldn't believe I'm looking to develop throughout the whole winter months, really, all of January and February. Uh, about three or four times a week because I did spectacular Aurora. Uh, and that to me was just absolutely magnificent. I think that. The photograph I was most pleased to take was the photograph of an Antarctica that was one of the ones that got flashed out there. Because people had said to me, you know, Antarctica is too far south, the space station doesn't really go that far, you won't get a picture. Uh, so it was great to have a photograph that was clear one way, and I just put it in the right place and saw Antarctica to the photo. And literally about three seconds later, the ground had come back in again, and you didn't see it. So that was something special to see. Another question coming from here. Yeah, on a spacewalk. So if you if you didn't have the paper attached, you were just flying off the space and all away from the space station. Um, we actually practiced this in it uh, using virtual reality in China in Houston. And we put up the we have actually got a very small jetpack on the space suit as well. So if we can completely detach from the space station and the cable snapped or it wasn't properly attached, then we can use this jetpack to try and get back. But it's very, very little um, fuel. If you like to use a flashing gas, it's very little fuel in that chip. Actually, you only really have one shot of trying to get this up with the chances. Um, otherwise, you just get a very small dip in space, and that's what we see a few months later, you would come back and talk a bit more about That's a great question. What happens if you get in space? Um, we have a pretty good medical cabinet on board the space station. Um, we are all trained to a fairly high level of first aid. So we're trained to take care of ourselves as much as possible. We can help from our flight surgeons. That's we obviously have medical experts on the ground who can help us if we have any problems. We're breaking the conference if we've got a flight surgeon as well as in space as well to make sure we keep them free and really healthy. Um, it's something that we can also do some minor surgery. We can do minor anesthetics. We can do minor like, dental work as well. Two so we can do a major one too. Um, but we wouldn't have a direct minor surgery on the space station. It's something we've got to have. Then we start to talk about getting into the sewer space ground and coming back down. So I've got a couple more of them. Okay, thank you. We'll go down. Okay, well, 